Uh, what, what I will try to do is um, complement what Ruben has uh, said by offering you, giving you a global perspective um, uh, of the challenge that we are facing in having economic and financial decision makers engage with the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. So I think the work that Ruben is doing here in Argentina is going to be very helpful for Argentina, but this is a broader challenge that we're facing. Because when you give a finance minister, or someone working in the Ministry of Finance, or even an economist, the list of 17 sustainable development goals, there's a reaction of being perplexed and at a loss on what to do. Where do you want me to start? Do you need to pick one goal? Do I need to take them all at once? How do I go about engaging with this agenda? So I'll offer some perspectives on uh, how we can have economic, financial decision makers engage with this agenda and it goes down a lot to how to structure incentives. Um, but I think it's important before I get there to do two things. One is to give you a little bit of the history that led us to the adoption of this agenda, which has very strong normative elements, as, as you said. And then tell you a little bit about what it is and looking beyond just the 17 goals and 169 targets and 221 indicators. So how did we get to this agenda? If, if you look to the 1990s, taking a little bit of historical perspective, up to the first years of the 21st century. This was an era that was unprecedented in increasing the standards of living of people around the world and bringing millions of people outside of poverty, out of poverty. Many developing countries, not all, but many developing countries converge to the income of richer countries. It was also a period in which democracy expanded, human rights expanded around the world. It was an area in which we had peace after the end of the Cold War, the Security Council of the United Nations was united and there was agreement on how to handle many of the pressing security issues at the time. So it was a period of hope, a period of progress. And we've achieved perhaps the highest standards of living that humanity has ever seen. Now, as we turned towards the 21st century, we started to see some fractures or fault lines or alarm bells on some of these trends. So, I cannot be exhaustive, but I'll just mention a, a few to illustrate. One has to do with the pressure on the environment, on the environment, on our environment, on our planet. Many scientists felt that we are trespassing planetary boundaries. If you look at biodiversity, for instance, if you look at preservation of land, water, forests, if you look perhaps more importantly at climate change, we are starting to infringe some of these planetary boundaries. So there was something with the way in which our economies, our societies were working that was starting to transgress and infringe on these environmental boundaries. So there was a challenge of environmental sustainability. Conflict started to change and emerge and re-emerge with a different phase. So since 2010 to last year, there was a tripling of the cases of conflict around the world and a doubling of deaths of civilians. Last year, there were more countries at war than in the preceding 30 years. So conflict re-emerge with a vengeance. It's a different type of conflict, it's not a conflict between countries, but it's a conflict that happens within countries with influence of external powers, and we have an international community in which the Security Council is not united and not able to address some of these challenges. And then perhaps finally, we have a, either very high levels or an increase in the levels of economic inequality and health inequality as well as some regressions in the progress that have been made in bringing people out of poverty. So here in, in this region, Latin America 
Caribbean alone, according to CEPAL, to a plan. In 2015, there was an increase of 5 million in the number of people living in poverty. 5 million people joined the ranks of the poor. So it is in this context that when member states of the United Nations started to think through what should replace the Millennium Development Goals, should we have a different development agenda, how do we connect and take forward the real plus 20, the environment agenda, basically they came to a conclusion, the peace and security side, that these are not actually separate dimensions. They all interlink and need to somehow come together. And that's what the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs are. So I'll tell you briefly, comparing them to the, to the MDGs, that there are three main differences, characteristics. One is that's an agenda that is obviously much wider than the MDGs. The MDGs were essentially a social agenda, looking at poverty, education, health. This is an agenda that looks at the elements of the way in which we as societies consume and produce things. So it calls for sustainable patterns of consumption and production. It looks and speaks to the need to have peaceful and inclusive societies, bringing in issues of governance, bringing in issues of um, rights. It's an agenda, second, that is much more ambitious than the Millennium Development Goals. It's an agenda, I don't know if you heard this expression, that asks for people to not be left behind leave no one behind. The MDGs, for those that know of the MDGs, ask for a reduction in the level of poverty by half. This is very good for those that benefit, but what about the other half that doesn't move out of poverty? So it's a much more ambitious agenda. And then perhaps more significant, it's an agenda that is universal. It's an agenda that breaks the dichotomy between developed and developing countries and all countries in the world are signing up to this agenda. Now, when this agenda was signed in 2015, three years ago, I myself wasn't sure whether countries were going to sort of take it seriously and adopt it. But what we've seen is that it is actually resonating with countries, with decision makers around the world. And last week I was in um, Paris in the OECD, at the meeting of the OECD, and I was struck to see how many OECD countries, so richer countries, are actually taking the SDGs and the 2030 Agenda as a framework to do their own planning and even their budgetary allocations in some senses. So it's an agenda that somehow is resonating with the decision makers and, and policy makers. Now, what, what it is then? It's an agenda, basically the point I'm trying to make is that it's an agenda that goes beyond the 17 SDGs and it's an invitation for all of us, for decision makers, for society, to take this integrated perspective that we need to consider if we are going to face the challenges and to address the structural lines that, that I mentioned. So I'll conclude then by trying to establish a link to the financing, financing issues. So again, to use an analogy, the time of the Millennium Development Goals was a time in which the narrative around financing was very simple and linear. It was a narrative about gaps, a little bit like uh, Ruben uh, started his presentation. So it was an agenda that set a few, a few targets, said, okay, where are we? How much money do we need to fill this in? And since the MDGs were supposed to be met in developing countries, the argument was that some of this could be managed through domestic resource mobilization and resources, and a lot of it had to be complemented by official development assistance uh, and private investment coming, coming from, from outside. So that was the, the logic of the MDGs. I think the logic with the Sustainable Development Goals has to change in a very fundamental way. Because in a way, every single resource in the world, every single dollar in the world has to change and move in ways that are aligned with sustainable development goals. It's no longer about meeting a financing gap. It's about changing incentives so that all capital, all resources in the world, public, private, move towards investments that bring us towards uh, activities, economic activities, decisions by consumers that move us towards the sustainable development goals and sustainability. And the challenge is 
clearly one of incentives and not one of the availability of resources. So Robert mentioned the figure about investable assets and the management. I'll give you another number. Currently, out of this total number that you mentioned, 130 trillion, if I'm not mistaken, there is as much as 10 trillion dollars sitting on negative yielding assets. Negative yielding assets. So the money is invested in assets that are losing and giving these investors a negative return. As you know, many central banks around the world are pursuing very low or even negative policy interest rates. Yes, we know. Well, you know. <laughs> no, no, no. And so says, the dinero is existing. The money is there. More importantly, the money is now being invested in assets that are yielding very little or even negative rates. So, what do we need to bring this two together? And it's all about changing incentives and. The, the private sector responds very quickly to this. Uh, I'll, I'll give an example. Currently, do you know where the lowest price for solar energy is in the world? Does anyone know? Argentina. <laughs> Argentina is pretty close. Yes, you're right. Germany? No. No. It's in the Persian Gulf. In the Persian Gulf. Or Syria, Argentina, or Portugal. Yes, it It is in the Persian Gulf. And these are economies that are still completely dependent for their energy needs and for their economies on fossil fuels, hydrocarbons. But what have they said? If you look at the policy signals that the decision makers in these countries are, are giving, is they know this is not sustainable in the long term. So they have presented plans of how they want to diversify and change their economies. So private investors respond very quickly. Respond very quickly because the technology is there to move towards these places. So this is what we need to do more systematically. It's about changing incentives. At this meeting that I mentioned in Paris at OECD, I was um, speaking with a, a, an asset manager the uh, largest asset manager in the UK, second largest in Europe. And what she was telling me is that they are completely changing the way in which they go about thinking of the SDGs and the Sustainable Development Goals and sustainability more broadly. Private corporations in the past look at these kind of issues as corporate social responsibility, as reputational risks, so they shouldn't really be engaged with the dirty activities, uh, pollution or tobacco or whatever it is, it might make them a reputational risk. So it was a, a risk approach to the way in which they engage with this agenda. Now private corporations more and more are looking at the SDGs as an opportunity, as a business opportunity. It's not widespread, but more and more they are shifting the criteria that they are considering to make decisions on their allocation of the funds they manage. <coughs> Again, because governments and countries are giving them the signal that they are taking this agenda seriously. And so I'll just conclude with a, a further reflection that perhaps tells us how we can uh, connect this agenda um, with the economic and financial decision makers. So it's, it's a little bit looking at the future and the challenges that we face in the future and reflecting on some of the fundamental changes that are occurring in our economies. One of the most stable um, uh, facts that characterize economies um, over the last decades, uh, perhaps over a century, has been that we've had a stable distribution of income between labor and capital. This has been so stable that Nicholas Calder called this one of the stylized facts of economic growth. And growth models, the solo model that uh, Ruben mentioned, and the Calder model, they were constructed to predict this stability in the distribution of income between labor and capital. Over the last few years, we're seeing a shift with much more income going to capital as opposed to labor. Related to this development, 
And this is happening across the world, Develop, developing countries, low-income countries around the world. Another tenet of uh, economic theory is that the most important determinant of uh, standards of living or earnings is productivity growth. And historically, you see that there is a correlation between increases in productivity growth and increases in earnings. So they move together historically. Over the last few years, there has been a disconnect. So even when productivity growth goes up, earnings stay stagnant. So these two factors are interrelated and they have a lot to do with some of the technological transformations that we've seen towards the digitalization of economy that make the replacement of labor by capital much easier to do. But also to a point that Ruben made with the way in which globalization has forced sort of a race to the bottom. So if you look at corporate income tax rates, for instance, the nine, from the 1990s to today, there has been a decrease in corporate income tax rates by from 10 to 50 percentage points. And this has happened in every economy in the world. Developed, emerging, low-income countries. Why? Because countries are competing with each other to attract more and more capital to their economies. I'm not making a judgment on whether this is right or wrong, because countries are responding once again to incentives, there is no coordination, countries are competing with each other. The point I'm making is that this is a development and a policy that is exacerbating exacerbating this transfer of resources and the income away from labor towards capital. That I mentioned it was largely due to technological change. So looking ahead to the implementation of the SDGs over the next 12-13 years, we are confronted with a technological evolution that is likely to exacerbate and make even more challenging some of these trends. Because apparently with artificial intelligence, with advances in automation, it's likely to become even easier to replace some labor with capital. The numbers vary. Uh, at the G20 meeting uh, yesterday, the OECD uh, revealed a study that said in OECD countries as many as 35% um, of jobs are at risk of automation in OECD countries. The World Bank recently published a study that said as, as many as, as much as two-thirds of jobs in developing countries are at risk of automation. We don't know the numbers, but it's a big challenge that we're going to confront. Ultimately, this is a positive, or it's likely to be a positive development, but the point I want to leave you with is that it is only positive if we manage it through the right policies. If we manage it through the right policies, when we had the transition from agriculture towards industrial societies, we faced similar constraints to the, or similar challenges, and we had to invent new institutions, trade unions, um, social protection. We invented institutions that enable a balance of the distribution of income between labor and uh, capital. So here, to, to take us to the, to the SDGs, we need to think of what are the kind of economic, financial, policies that will give us the incentives that will enable us to rebalance the distribution of income between labor and capital. I mean, I don't want to, I use this as an illustration, but I don't want to, to suggest that this is the only issue that we should consider, just, just uh, to illustrate what I, what I mean. Some of the tax policies that we have in place, for instance, are encouraging the overuse of fossil fuels, for instance, compared to what would be the case uh, at market prices. Now, this obviously has an effect on environmental aspects of the SDGs, but it also has a, an impact on job creation, because firms will tend to invest in capital buyers activities because they are being subsidized to make those, those, those investments. So the conclusion, or what I wanted to, to take away of this complicated story, is that to take us to the, to the SDGs and the 2030 agenda, we need to, to think in a different way. We need to think about an integrated way 
and not circumscribe ourselves when we make decisions about financial and economic policies, even if they seem to be the right one from that perspective, we need to think about the consequences that they may have around the wide and uh, broader of, of, of issues. And I think that um, to conclude the research that we're going to do here, Ruben, is going to be very helpful in Argentina, and hopefully it can even be a model that we can use and take to other countries to help financial and economic decision makers deal with this challenge. Thank you.